Hello, Andy. Aaron. Let me know if I'm turned sideways because I did that one week. Make sure my camera's right. I am sideways. Okay. That's actually fine. Wait for it. How about that? Is that better? I want a mic. Oh, Rob. Is that better? have to use whatever is available to get this thing propped up right so I've got a pencil under it I see Tevin uh, give everybody just another minute okay this is my normal <coughs> my normal Tuesday evening Bible study for men um, sometimes we have women join us and that's fine um, but I am going to be teaching uh, men's uh, Bible study for as long as the Lord leads me um, on things that a husband and father should do and things that future husbands and fathers should do. So in other words, single men can gain from this. Uh, women can probably gain from this. But um, my heart is just to teach a men's Bible study uh, for the men and from a man's point of view. So I am going to um, be talking tonight about goals for your family. Um, I, I have five goals that I think every Christian man should have for their family. And I'm going to start off with um, Ephesians chapter 5, starting in 23, where uh, Paul writes, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, men, we like to hear that verse because it it uh, sometimes is misinterpreted as, um, well, she has to do what I have I say. She has to obey me, and and so then we read on further, a little more clarification. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that He might present it to Himself as a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So when we read that, men, we, we understand that we are supposed to treat our wives just like Christ did the, the church and how Christ did when he was here. And think about that. Does that does that make you feel like they have to obey what I want, want them to do? They have to listen to me. Christ loved the church and loved uh, the saints and loved the people while he was here to the point where he washed their feet. He was a servant to them. He laid down his life for them. So when you when you read that in perspective, don't get cocky about it being the head of the, the head of the home. Um, and I mentioned. Uh, uh, Sunday in another message um, that being in authority does not make, mean superiority. So uh, you are not superior to your wife uh, just because you are in authority over your family. You're not superior to them. It's just the role that, that God has put you in. Um, and I had some um, insight that um, I wanted to share with you about the head and the body. If you are the head, uh, the head leads the body, directs the body, makes the decisions what the body's going to do, but it is based on the feelings of the body. 
is based on input from the body. So think about that a minute. If you're the head of a body, then you are deciding, but the rest of the body actually um, makes gives you input to make you make your decisions. So, for instance, I'm um, I'm hungry. The rest of my body's hungry. Then my mind says I need to eat. And uh, you can just imagine any kind of scenario where your body responds, um, where you need to um, pick up something and it's hot and you drop it, then your mind has made that decision based on the input from your body. So think about your the body that you are over. Think about your family and the input that you get from them. If you are looking at uh, making decisions, you cannot do it apart from them. And Paul wrote and said, um, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now guys, we've got to admit, when we hurt our wives, we hurt ourselves. No man ever hurt his, hurt his wife's feelings or um, hurt her in some other way that he didn't suffer for it. And generally worse, you know, generally longer. So, so uh, we need to be very careful about how we treat our families. Um, and the last thing before I go into these goals is if you're the head of the body um, and you're leading, where, where are you leading and what are you leading to? So you can't just say, I'm the head of, of my family and I'm leading my family. You have to think about what you're heading to. So I want us to think about goals tonight. And I've got five categories of goals and I've got scripture for them. Five categories of goals that every man of God should have for their family. Um, let's think about what would you lead your family to do. Um, first of all, before I get into these, I want to go to Habakkuk chapter 2, um, 2 and 3. And some of you may be familiar with this passage, even when I call it out. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3. Um... And the prophet writes, uh, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. All right, I've, I read that because I believe that goals are always best when they're written down. Um, verbal goals are fine if you tell somebody something, but if you have it written down, you're going to be more apt to keep that goal. If you write it down, others can also see and come back and check up on you uh, that this is the goal. <coughs> so I would encourage you men to write your goals down. Write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for it is for an appointed time. Now, I know that in, this is prophetic and this was something given to the prophet. But I firmly believe that um, people of God should write things down. I, I knew uh, someone who had a prayer journal one time. They wrote everything down. And then they went back in that prayer journal and they, they was able to check off the things and see that God always answered prayer. And I like that. I like the bit being able to record things and, and go back and see also as a uh, benchmark to see where how far you've grown. Okay, so... So I told you I was going to give you five goals, and um, you know I'm primarily doing my studies from Proverbs because there's a lot of wisdom in Proverbs. So I'm in Proverbs chapter 20 for the first one, Proverbs chapter 20, and my first goal of five is family harmony. I believe that you need to have a goal of family harmony. Um, your family should be a sanctuary from the uh, troubles of this world. Now, we use the word sanctuary to talk about a room in the church, and I think that's great because it is sanctuary. But inside the walls of your house, it should be sanctuary, and it should be a peaceful place. And then Proverbs 20 and verse 3, it says, It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. An honor for you to cease from strife. So we are supposed to have homes that are free from strife. Um, 
as the head of your home, you have the responsibility to stop strife. Some strife may come from you, and if it is, then you really need to, to stop that. Uh, children can start strife. Your wife may have strife. We need to make sure we are peacemakers in our home. We need to make sure that we do not allow strife in our home and, and keep peace and harmony among our family. Our families are witnesses in the communities to the testimony of Christ, and we need to make sure that we're in harmony. Um, Romans 14, 19 says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and, the, and things wherewith one may edify another. Follow after things which make peace. Well, certainly that means our families. Uh, if we are thinking about as, as people of God, we need to follow after the things that make peace. I mean, it's, it's sort of foolish to think about that we're peacemakers and we go out into the community and we make peace in society and yet we can't keep our own houses in order. I mean, I think everybody can agree with that. We have, we have to make sure that we are peacemakers. So um, I, I read reading one from a couple of studies ago um, about fathers, and this is Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's in Ephesians. So fathers, you have a... Um, a possibility of irritating your children to wrath, provoking them, it says. And if you get like that, and I have done it before, uh, we can get in the flesh, we can get irritated with our children, we can uh, start picking on them, we can start bullying them, and I've been, in my last studies, been very um, adamant that we are, we should never be bullies to our wives or our children we need to make sure that we do not tower over them that we do not raise our voice that is in an intimidating way to frighten them and make sure we don't provoke our children to wrath now i realize you lose your anger with your children sometimes and uh and i'm sure there are times when it's called upon but we have to be very careful not to lean the other way and not to get in our flesh that that is where abuse comes in and we are not to provoke our children to wrath. Uh, Psalms 20, 133, verse 1, Behold, how good and pl how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So that's my last passage on family harmony. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When you see the model of Christian family, you are representing the body of Christ. You, you are representing, uh, the family is the body of the church, and the, and the man is in the place of Christ and representative. So we we have to be uh, on our guard to always make sure that we look the right look the uh, the right image. Now, something comes to mind in that um, you can drive to church and be yelling and screaming and strife, and step out in church and uh, put smiles on. And um, and everybody's at peace and walk in and go, hello, you know, we're we're all we're a sweet family, aren't we? And put on this big air that you're uh, you've got everything under control. But let me tell you, your sins will find you out. You will be caught if you are a family that is putting on a fake air in front of uh, a church full of people, and every Sunday you're you're rushed out the door, nobody bothered to dress the kids and or the dad didn't help and the mother's having to do all the things with the kids changing diapers and the father's in there reading the newspaper and drinking coffee and the mom's dressing the kids and the mom's making breakfast and the mom's getting stuff ready for lunch so when they get home and the dad does nothing and then all the way to church there's this big fight going on and you get out of church and you put a smile on that is being hypocrite and you will be caught uh, the world will see uh, quickly how your family is if nothing else your children will give you away so make sure that you have family harmony as one of your goals uh, number two spiritual goals now I'm not giving these in necessarily the the order that they should be thought of or of importance spiritual goals are obviously very important um, I think that these all work together and tie together and I think family harmony is a spiritual goal 
Uh, in other words, if you have family harmony and you live in peace, that is that should be a spiritual goal. But the spiritual goals I'm going to list today, um, uh, and I've got uh, two passages in Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, starting with verse 9, <clears throat> it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou uh, risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And then in Deuteronomy 19, 18, it says, Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house, and upon thy gates, and your, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. So, the, the first bullet point, if you will, of spiritual goals is to talk about spiritual matters regularly. Because both of those passages talked about, talk, talk about with your family when you're sitting down and when you're rising up. Um, gentlemen, you need conversation on a spiritual level with your wife and with your children. You need to be talking about biblical matters <clears throat> now i can honestly relate to some of you that feel like i really don't want to talk about that kind of stuff i don't know enough about the bible my wife knows more about the bible than i do i understand that um my wife is a is a student of the bible my wife uh teaches a women's bible study she had one this morning uh this afternoon at one o'clock uh, on her facebook post and she knows the Bible. She is a she's been a longtime student of the Bible. Um, don't let don't let anybody intimidate you to your lack of knowledge. Um, just make it a point to talk about spiritual matters. If a question comes up, if one of your children asks a question and you don't know the answer, don't be intimidated by that. Just learn together, grow together. So you need to talk about spiritual matters regularly. The second part of spiritual spiritual growth is um, attend church regularly. In Hebrews chapter ten, actually, my let me go right to it in my Bible. I've got some notes in my um, the printout was so small on that. I'm gonna need my magnifying glass. Magnif <laughs> Hebrews ten twenty three through twenty five. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke, provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we are supposed to be going to church. Now, I realize a lot of people don't have a church haven't found a church, and I understand that. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time to get uh, keyed into a church, find one that fits your family, find one that's in your neighborhood. Um, and uh, and I understand that because we, we saw it a long time and we ended up home churching and um, uh, it worked out really good for us for the past 20 years we've home churched. Um, we've had people come and go through here. We have a few people that's not family that come to church with us. Um, you may be, be able to find a home church in your area, but you need to be in church, man. We need to be going to church and not just sending our kids or sending our family. We need to make sure we're in church. Our jobs sometimes get in the way. Uh, I understand the way society is. Sometimes men do jobs that are, um, that are in um, the area where they get called out on Sundays or they are um, part of a job where, you know, they, they need to leave on Sunday or maybe they work on Sunday as a regular day. Um, attend church as much as possible. And that last part of that passage says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. 
as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So how much church should you attend? That last part, as the, uh, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the day approaching is um, the, end, the end times. And if we see that day approaching, we're supposed to be exhorting one another and gathering together more. So I'll leave you with that, that we need to be attending church regularly. Um, Acts chapter 10, verse 2, we need to be praying as a family. Acts 10, verse 2. Actually, let's just start from 1, read 1 um, and 2. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Okay, it says he feared God with all his house. So it's obvious that this man uh, had his house in order. He led his house. We uh, we know that Cornelius was the first Gentile to to receive the gospel. We know that because he sought God, he uh, prayed, he gave alms. Um, because he sought God like this, he and his household were saved. We need to be praying as a family. Um, you know, a lot of times people don't even pray over, over their meals anymore. And I think that's something that that sets a precedent in your children. I have grandchildren who now will not eat before they pray. Um, I never see people praying in restaurants anymore. And when I was a kid, uh, everybody seemed to stop and pray over the meals. Are you praying with your family? Are you praying over your meals? Do you lead your family in prayer? Sometimes gentlemen have, um, have a hard time speaking in public, praying in public. Sometimes it's embarrassing for you. Um, that'll be a good a good goal to overcome that. If you're think about it, if your son or daughter doesn't see you praying, will they grow up praying? If they if they see you and you never pray, they've never have any memories of you praying. What kind of precedent are you setting for that child? Um, there is an image that you you live that they they live with forever of their father. And that image should include you in prayer, you even on your knees, praying for them. Um, even if they get off in rebellion, if you pray for those children, that image will come back to them. Um, and lastly, and this kind of ties all this in, have a family devotion time. Uh, get together and have a regular devotion time with your family. You may take them to church. Um, you may, you know, take them to vacation Bible school. You may sit down with your wife, and she may have her own Bible study. But you need a regular devotion, a regular time with your family. And that doesn't have to be so strict that you, you won't enjoy it, and they won't enjoy it either. In fact, I'll guarantee you, if you don't enjoy it, they will not enjoy it. I mean, it's not going to be something like we spoon-feed castor oil to our family. Find something that you enjoy doing and then share it with them. Um, even something that is um, like Bible trivia um, for you, if your children are young, color sheets for your children. Uh, <coughs> when I was growing up, my mom and dad had a small um, thing on the dining room table, it's about four inches long, and on the side it said Honey in the Rock. And inside that little plastic piece like a rock was scripture cards and every time we sit down to eat you know we would we would get through and then somebody would get to pull one of the scriptures out and read it then we went through that so that's a memory i have those are scriptures i heard you know from my youth uh you can you could make something like that you can come up with your own idea that fits your family but if you have a family devotion time, even if and so that's just something very simple. If you have something that's that's like that, that that's stuck in my memory, it'll stick in their memory. It will mean so much to your wife for you to be stepping in. If you're the head of the home, you're supposed to be leading spiritually. Amen. 
Okay, number three is financial goals. And uh, a lot of times we don't have those. A lot of times, you know, if I guess all of these we may skip over. But we should make sure that we have financial goals for our family. I would say that that is a necessary thing for a Christian family to do. And we so often don't even think about it. We just live paycheck to paycheck. We don't teach our children about financial things. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that they're not going to learn by osmosis. It's not something that they just pick up on to, do, to, to uh, be financially responsible. But think about it having, um, having a budget and living within it. Now, that doesn't mean you use that to beat them over the head every time they want something or need something. We have no money. We have no money. We have no money. If they are needing something, dad, husband, if they're needing something, whose job is it to provide that? Doesn't sound so good to be head of the home anymore, does it? You know, it's our responsibility. We are supposed to provide for our families financially. And I understand there are some women that have to work. Uh, you know, there are, there are sometimes there are situations where men get disabled and they can't work. The woman has to leave. Sometimes there are families that have no husband, have no father, and the women have to work. I understand that. But, guys, primarily it is our responsibility to provide financially for, for a home. Now, Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And Solomon gave us this. And before you mock and say, well, he was an extremely rich man, that's something that he picked up on. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So that tells me that we need to make sure we are debt-free, if we can be, and that we live within our means. We don't go out and buy automobiles and and all kind of other things that we can't afford just because our flesh wants it. Uh, we put ourselves last. Just like Christ put the, the people first and himself last when he was exhausted, he continued to minister to people. And we need to make sure that we treat our families that way. <coughs> um, another about, this is in Romans 13, uh, another one about Romans about um, being financially responsible is to be financially responsible with your taxes and leading your family to understand uh, about authority financially. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doth, doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but for also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear honor to whom honor owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law so that tells us we have to be law uh, law keepers and we have to pay our taxes and keep all the the laws that way. Uh, we need to make sure that we are financially obeying laws. Do not cheat on your taxes. Um, obey authority. Amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. The next bullet point of being financial, having financial goals is to be givers, to be charitable. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. 
Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So let me ask you this, men. Are you givers? Are you charitable? Do you give money to people that are in need? Um, so many times we we say, well, you know, I got, I'm taking care of my family first, my family first, my family first. Imagine, if you will, Jesus sits down with the 5,000 and the fish and the bread, and he's got them out 5,000 deep, and he starts and he takes care of the front row. And before he gets through with the front row, the people on the end are hungry again or want more, so they turn around and they go back, and they go back, and they go back, and the people in the back never get any help. That's the way we are when we say, I'm taking care of my family, and we forget the rest of the world. If we, if we only take care of our family and we are not charitable for the rest of the world, then we, are, we act like that. We act like our family is all I can take care of. So I want you to be thinking about your charity. I want you to be thinking about being a giver. And give as you purposed in your heart. Think about your goals, your, your financial goals. And let your children see that you're a giver. If you grow up sting, if they grow up with you being stingy, they will be stingy. If they see you, you never give to any kind of charity. You ne never give to anybody that is in need. They will grow up that way. I can honestly say that my children are givers, and even, and they none of them have very much money. But I have seen um, several amazing things where they gave, even though they didn't have things themselves. Um, and it touched my heart. Uh, I actually will tell you about one of them. Um, an instance, I won't list who it, who it was, but it's one of my children. We pulled up at a, um, a quick shop and we went in, got a snack, got a drink and a, something for them to munch on because we was traveling. And we came back to the car and I turned around and noticed one of the kids didn't have something. But I was sure that they had lined up and, and we bought it all. And uh, Angie actually asked and said, didn't you get something? Um, why didn't, where is it? And she said, um, that carload of people pulled up right there and those kids was in the back seat. And she said, mama, they don't have anything. And she said, I gave, there was a pack of something that had like crackers in it or whatever. And she said, and I leaned in and gave it to them. And you talk about touching me that, you know, have one of my children be charitable like that. You know, we need to make sure that we instill that in our children. And, of course, you know, we turned around and went back and, you know, got her whatever she wanted. But I'm telling you, gentlemen, you can impress on your children to love people they don't even know and share the gospel that way. Um, the fourth goal that I have uh, are physical goals. And by that I mean... Uh, you can set a healthy lifestyle for your family and set the the um, mark to live in a in where you take care of your bodies. Um, we forget this sometimes. We overlook it. We say, "Well, our bo my body's going to die anyway. I'm just going to eat what I want." Well, there's no need watching my weight now. You know, uh, just I'm not an athlete anymore. Or I'm not in high school anymore. I don't have to impress anybody anymore. And, you know, we let ourselves go. Gentlemen, we have to set the standard. We have to set goals for our family of being physically healthy. We have to make sure that we take care of our body. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Actually, that works good because I'm right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Oh, I'm in 2 Corinthians. I thought I was right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's always bad when there's not enough verses in the chapter. You know, you need to go somewhere else. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I, I never like taking scripture out of, out of context. And I want to tell you that this is primarily talking about fornication and sexual sins. 
But my point is, Paul said that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Think about the temple. Think about the church. Think about abusing the church, um, letting it go. Think about not taking care of your church building. If you if you were a caretaker of a church and you said, you know, there's no need in it because God doesn't dwell in temples or in buildings anyway, and let's don't worry about keeping it clean. We don't need to dump the garbage. We don't need to vacuum the carpet. Nobody does that, I hope. Nobody lets their church go. So your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are you taking care of your body? Are you eating right? Are you living healthy? Are you setting standards for your family that that show them that you need to be living healthier um, we set the pace in that respect men so we need to make sure we live a healthy lifestyle and set the goals for our family of physical health um, first Timothy 4 6 through 8 says if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine Whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather into godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Now, I brought this pa passage in because we don't need to go overboard with bodily exercise. I know there are people that are bodybuilders, and they get into this almost religious mode where oh my body is the temple i have to treat my body like the temple and they and they really do overboard about everything and you know i've seen men get harsh with their families because they're, they're like the extreme in the other direction they they will not use moderation in things uh oh we can't eat fast food well you know what sometimes you can't find anything but fast food sometimes that's the only thing that there is to eat um, so don't get so overboard in the other direction where you you attend the health spa or the gym more than you do church. I hope I hope I'm clear on that. I, I read that passage because it says that bodily exercise profiteth little. So we know it profits our body for a short period of time, but the healthiest person is going to die anyway. The health the person is eats the best and if their body in shape, they still are going to die. We do need to make sure we take care of ourselves, but not overly overly uh, doing it and putting it above all these other goals. <clears throat> and the last, um, the last goal I have in my five goals are social goals. Being socially connected with your community. Uh, and I'm looking at Mark uh, 1615, which is the Great Commission. And you, you will be familiar with this passage, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Jesus said to go into all the world. So what happens when we as the head of our home stay at home and never go anywhere? What, what if we're reclusives? What if we're introverts? What if we raise our children so that they are afraid to go out in public or so that they just don't want to leave the house? If we have a family that is not connected with the, with the world around them, what good are we? You know, what good are we to the world, ministering to the world, if all we're really doing is going home and locking the doors and locking the world out? And I got another passage in Matthew 5, uh, verse 13, that I want to read. <clears throat> this also is Jesus speaking. <clears throat> you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, if you're not socially connected with the world around you, you are like salt that has lost its savor, and you're like 
putting a cover over a, a lamp where nobody can see the light. And he said, you're a city on a hill. How can you be a city on a hill if your family, your, your Christian family, never go outside the doors of your home? I mean, obviously we go to church. We already talked about that. But if you never connect with your neighbors, if you never connect with those in your community, if you never leave your house, and that, that seems to be more and more so that people, they're self-entertained, they have their snacks, and they have their TV, and they have their video games, and computers, and tablets, and on and on. we got all our devices, and we never want to go. Well, this, this has something to do with being out and, and um, bodily exercise, too. Um, being out and being physical, going for a walk in the woods, going for a walk in a park, spending time outside. Um, we need to make sure that we are um, socially connected with our world. That's what Christ saved us for, so we could spread the gospel, share the light to others. All right, so I'm going to recap before I finish. Um, and these, these are the five. Uh, first of all, write them down. Let your family talk to your family about this, things that you're thinking about. Um, family harmony. You need to have make sure your family is in harmony. Spiritual goals. <coughs> excuse me. You need to make sure you set spiritual goals for your family. Uh, Bible study, uh, devotions, uh, and I and I mentioned um, make it fun for your family. Financial goals. Make sure you live within your means. Make sure that you live financially responsible. Stay out of debt. Take care of your family financially. Um, physical goals where you take care of yourself physically. And finally, social goals where you uh, make sure you your family is known for something. Um, do you have a mission statement at work? You know, a lot, of, a lot of churches have mission statements. A lot of companies have mission statements. Have you thought about a mission statement for your family? What does my family going to be? Think about that just a minute. If you said, if I said, fill in the blank, my family is known for something. What would the, what would the answer be to that question? What would you fill in that your family is known for? We read a book um, many years ago, probably over fifteen years ago, about a plain family, and that's that's what we are. We're plain dressed people. Um, plain family that lived out on a farm and they set a standard where they got a lot of visitors people came and bought butter and cheese and those kind of things and the father set a standard and he said um, I want to make sure that whoever comes here doesn't leave without something in their hand as a gift not just that we buy, they sell things and he said and also that somebody doesn't share the gospel to them and the writer of this book heard about this family and he went, wanted to visit. And when he, when he uh, drove up, the children were running down the dirt road holding tracks in their hand and wanting to give it to him. This father had set this standard. And it really moved me as a, as a father and a husband. And I, I made that decision about our house that we would minister to anybody that showed up here, give them something. They wouldn't leave here without something in their hand. We give them a jar of honey or, or a butter or something I've made in a blacksmith shop. And also that we share about Christ. Now we've had, we've had uh, um, two newspapers came and did a story on us. Actually three newspapers. And we had a TV station came and did a, a little five minute excerpt on us one time. And we had the, the, um, the great uh, privilege of ministering to those people not because of the story even though that it was uh, used on that also we were able to share the gospel in that but we actually were able to talk to the reporters and just and just talk to them about Jesus and I'm not I'm not doing that to be prideful but I'm, I'm trying to tell you as an example that you can set a goal for your family that your family will be known for something the family that I read about in that book they moved me they changed me, they reached me, and I've never met them. So what's your family known for? Is it known because you're a football fan? Is that the greatest thing? Well, the Smith family, the Jones family, they're the biggest football fans I know. Is that what you really want to be known for? 
or are you known because you're people of God? You see, men, we set the standard for our family. We may not be doing it verbally. We may not be doing it on paper like I was talking about, but we set the standards and set the goals. Um, we, we need to be doing it so that our family is known for something and not something negative. You know, we need to make sure that, that we certainly make sure that we're not known for negative things. And the last thing I'm going to leave with you is to set goals that every family member can accomplish. So when you set goals for your family, don't set goals like you're setting them for Junior or for your daughter or for your wife. Make sure everybody has a part in it things that everybody can accomplish. Now you may have personal goals. Um, you may decide you want to learn to play the piano. Your wife may decide that she wants to play the violin. You may decide you're going to have a music night. Those are great things to do as a family. But for family goals, what I'm talking about tonight, make sure that you set goals, that you write them down, that you discuss them with your family, talk about them so that your family can be in order and that you can be a light on a hill. Now, I hope you've gained from that. I haven't ever been watching. Uh, I see Ricky on there and Lenny and my, um, actually, I don't know if I can go back through these comments or not. I haven't really been watching them. Good to see you, Ricky, Peggy, Jerry. I see one of my Junkins on here. Um, Diana, I see you on here. Dennis, Duke, Mike. Uh, Tiffany, Tim, Ron, lots of people. I, I don't know if they've stayed on here, but I got 13 watching right now. So I appreciate your time. Um, like I said, I'm doing this on Tuesday evening, 630, and I'm doing this primarily for men. Women, you, I'm sure you can gain something from this also, but I want men to uh, hear from my heart. Uh, I started it out, for those of you who may not have been on any of the other studies, I started this out talking to men so that men are responsible for their families in a spiritual manner and from as a Christian man. And um, I'm going to post this on YouTube for any of you who may have missed some of it. I, I've got all of them on our YouTube channel. It's, I think it's Shepherd's Hill, um, I don't know if it's Shepherd's Hill Homestead one or shepherd's hill farm but i will be sharing the link on here and i appreciate your time tonight i'm gonna let it run just a little bit longer because i know there's a delay in it but good night everybody if you have um also have ideas for a study please uh message me let me know about it questions that you've got and, and i can write up a study on it